So welcome to the second day of our conference on sanctions and divestments and um, for being here at a relatively early hour in the morning. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the moderator for this session, uh, Eric Alterman. Eric is a uh, very well-known journalist who has a provocative and uh, important blog called Altercation. He's a professor uh, at CUNY and um, has written important books, one of which is When Presidents Lie, A History of Official Deception and Its Consequences. And it's a great pleasure to have him here and to uh, be the moderator, introducer, and uh, all good things in this session. Okay, thank you, Eric. Thank you, Arian. Uh, can everybody hear me? Good. Um, I'll introduce people as they speak so that you're, they're fresh in your memory as who they are. Um, we're gonna begin with our Skype presentation um, from Australia, I believe. Uh, Sean Turnell is our first speaker. By the way, uh, each speaker is going to speak for 20 minutes. And then I've, I've given uh, Marcus and uh, Bill Leogrand notice, and I guess I hope I'm giving Sean notice now, that I'm going to ask everyone to comment on the differences and similarities they see in their own cases uh, and what they've heard in the presentation. So um, pay attention. Um, Anyway, so these presentations will uh, go one, uh, one, two, three, in 20 minutes each, approximately. Uh, Sean Turnell, who's appearing uh, behind me, is a former senior, senior analyst at the Reserve Bank of Australia and is now uh, in the economics department at Macquarie University, where he's been since 1991. Uh, he's written a book examining the history of Burma's monetary and financial system called Fiery Dragons, Banks, Money Lenders, and Microfinance in Burma. In Burma. That was published in 2009. And um, he's done a lot of work on the uh, attempt to reform the architecture of the global economy in the first half of the 20th century. Uh, so uh, Sean is going to talk about um, Burma, and then uh, we'll go on from there. Sean. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, and thank you to everyone there for, uh, for being there to listen to this. Um, I'll, I'll put one caveat at the start of this, um, which is just to say that it's well after midnight here in Sydney, um, and I'll use that as, a, as an excuse if um, what I'm about to present doesn't make any sense at all. Um, I'll use that excuse um, uh, as we go along. Um, which brings me, I guess, to the point of the argument that I want to uh, try and uh, present today, uh, which is, to some extent, quite an unfashionable one and certainly a controversial one as well, uh, and that is that I'll attempt to argue that sanctions, uh, but in particular the financial variety that were imposed by the United States, particularly in the mid-2000s, were part of an effective program, amongst other things. We can never be totally sure, I think, what drove the changes in Burma. But I think uh, my, the position that I want to take today is that US sanctions, as well as those of other countries, but I think US financial sanctions in particular, were important drivers uh, of those particular changes. Um, having said that, uh, I, I'd also like to bring in another caveat, uh, and that caveat is that it's my experience with Burma, and I suspect it's the case with many of the other countries that we're looking at as well, uh, is that people of goodwill and great intelligence and knowledge and wisdom and so on are likely to come up with diametrically opposed views on the sanctions question, um, and certainly that's the case in Burma, uh, which behoves us, I guess, in that context, uh, that the, uh, the disagreements take place in a sort of uh, civil context, um, uh, which sometimes, sometimes uh, occurs uh, when it comes to Burma. Anyway, but, but I will be essentially taking the line that, uh, that I think the sanctions uh, were quite effective. Um, okay, which brings, I suppose, before we get to that, of why I think that they were effective at this time, uh, to ask the question of 
what they were, uh, who levied them and so on. So to begin with that, um, quite a number of countries levied sanctions in Burma down the years. Uh, so the European Union, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, they were all part of a sanctions movement. With those countries, the sanctions tended to be, of, I guess, of a fairly mild variety and symbolic as much as anything else. But they did in, uh, encapsulate investment bans. Mo most of the uh, sanctions uh, did that. Uh, limited trade bans, limited financial sanctions and uh, uh, some limited visa bans as well. Uh, far and away, the most extensive sanctions were, of course, levied by the United States. Uh, and I guess the things there that got the, the headlines was a, a broad import ban, which came in in 2003. And that, uh, well, as its name implies, banned all imports from Burma. Uh, so that was the sort of most blanket one, I guess. Um, there was a broad investment ban as well, which had been in place uh, nearly a decade earlier, instigated by the Clinton administration. Uh, but then some new ones which came on as the 2000s went on, uh, and in particular, I think most significantly, were some targeted financial sanctions. And it's those sanctions that, uh, as I suggested earlier, that I think were the most effective ones. Uh, likewise, there was a visa ban in the US um, and something called an SDN list, which again, I'm sure everyone there is very familiar with and has probably been discussed already, the specially designated nationals list. And that certainly, I think, had an impact as well. I'll touch upon that a little while later because that's the remaining sanction uh, that, that is in place, um, which is a nice segue actually just to talk about, well, What's the story now in terms of sanctions? And the story is that just about all of the sanctions have been lifted now. So the EU lifted its sanctions in 2012, as did Australia, as did New Zealand, as did Canada. Uh, the United States uh, lifted sanctions in a, in a more gradual way, uh, but they're just about all gone now as well. Uh, well, actually, I should be careful here. Instead of saying all gone, they've been suspended. So the, the sanctions, most of them anyway, remain on the books, uh, whereupon that they could descend at, um, uh, if, if necessary. Um, but um, so the investment ban is, is lifted, the, um, the import ban is lifted, uh, the financial sanctions in the broader sense is lifted. Uh, what remains is the, uh, the SDN list, which again, I mentioned, I'll, I'll come to that uh, later on. Okay, so those, those are the sanctions that were employed in Burma, and as I say, they really begin in, in about the mid-1990s, uh, but really ramped up, uh, which is my point that I'll come to uh, as the 2000s went on. Okay, so why do I argue that sanctions may have played a role uh, in bringing change to Burma? And, and here the, the chronology is really important. Um, I'm, I'm really talking about the changes that took place in 2011 once the new government uh, of uh, Tan Sein, which came in uh, earlier that year, uh, once changes and reforms really started to happen, that's really, I guess, the, the point that I'm talking to, that the sanctions uh, played a role there. Okay, so what, what what is my argument? Well, the first aspect relates to timing. Um, and I guess an observation that I, I don't think it's a coincidence that we really have movement uh, in Burma, politically and economically in all sorts of ways, more or less exactly at the time that the financial sanctions had really begun to bite. So the financial sanctions were levied in a very serious way from 2007, but they really begin to bite in about 2009. So the changes in 2011 roughly coincide with a couple of years of the financial sanctions uh, really starting to bite. Now, at this point, then, it's important just to talk a little bit more about what these sanctions were about uh, and the importance of them, which I think really gets to the idea that these sanctions became effective Effectively multilateral. And so even though they were levied by the United States, uh, their effect was much broader than the United States. Now, that's for the very simple reason, of course, uh, that most trade uh, takes place in the US dollar. So even though US Burma trade was actually uh, very small and always has been, the trade in most of Burma's commodities, uh, including in energy, which rose in importance uh, in recent times, but other commodities as well, uh, more or less all took place in the US dollar. So what this required, of course, was transactions amongst uh, correspondent accounts, uh, 
here in New York. And so um, the US sanctions uh, were much broader than any particular relationship uh, with the United States. Um, but I think even more important than that is that various uh, multipliers kicked in in this process. Uh, and those multipliers were effectively that the private sector did a lot of the financial sanctions work uh, for the US Treasury, which was formerly the institution levying the sanctions. So what you had was a situation developing from 2009 in particular, where banks all around the world basically just didn't want to touch uh, Burmese financial transactions. So, for instance, in my home country here, uh, here in Sydney, where I am uh, at the moment, um, I remember one particular time where I wanted to go to Burma and I wanted to uh, get some crisp US $100 bills, which were the only uh, currency notes that you could really use there. Um, and as soon as I told the bank that uh, the bank just in conversation had asked where I was going, and I mentioned that I was going to Burma, and they immediately stopped the transaction, even though there was in fact no reason to link uh, their handing over of physical US dollar cash to me and Burma at all beyond my uh, my confession of that in in a just in a conversational way. Uh, but anyway, Australia didn't have financial sanctions, and yet what the bank was worried about that was one of the big local banks here was being caught in the net uh, of providing financial services to Burma and in that way breaching US uh, financial sanctions and endangering the relationship in the United States. And that more or less happened uh, in banks uh, right across the region. So these sanctions, which were unilateral uh, and imposed by the United States, effectively became multilateral. Uh, for all sorts of reasons, but as I say, not least, I think, uh, the way in which financial institutions around the world just wanted to avoid uh, getting into trouble, basically, uh, when it came to the US. Uh, the other aspect, I think, which made these sanctions uh, very effective is that they had an impact on people in a very visceral and, per and personal way. And, and when I say people, of course, I'm talking about the elite in Burma. Uh, the average person in Burma doesn't even have a bank account, let alone, let alone engage in uh, international financial transactions. But the sort of people who did were part of the elite, and the sort of things they liked to do then and still like to do is send their kids to US colleges, uh, not only US colleges, but other colleges around the world, etc. as well, uh, go on holidays and do the usual middle class things. But of course, that requires, likewise, access to the U US financial system in a, in a really basic way in that it usually required US dollars. So in other words, these financial sanctions were not just business sanctions. They really had an impact on the elite uh, of society uh, at around this time. And it really began to bite, uh, as I say, around 2009, just at the time when the, the nature of the government that would come in after the old dictator Than Shui had stood aside, uh, these things were really beginning to bite. Um, likewise, I think it's important to stress that um, when, when you talked to Burmese people around that time, and again, this same cohort are very much elite and connected figures, they would complain bitterly about the sanctions uh, and, and the impact that this had on them personally. So it's not really just an abstract observation. It, it also comes from, you know, just talking to people and some anecdotes and so on as well. Um, so that's the first item. Uh, another aspect, I think, to do with timing is that this also led to changes in the policies of some other countries, but in particular Singapore, uh, which had always been the financial haven uh, to some extent to, uh, uh, to the Burmese leadership, to the Burmese government uh, and to the same elite cohort that I mentioned. And it was around this time as well, likewise in response to US sanctions, that Singapore really began to revise things. And there was a couple of celebrations cases where well-known Burmese business, which had been welcome uh, in the country only uh, a few years earlier, uh, had begun to find things closing off to them. Uh, Singapore, I think, is just the most important example, but there are other examples in Southeast Asia as well. Now, what effectively all that led to, of course, was that Burma still had one option, uh, and people used to say that this option uh, was the one that was at saving grace and the thing that made sanctions ineffective. And that option, of course, was China. Um, and so as we get towards the late uh the late 2000s, Burma's relationship uh, with China becomes ever deeper. Now, it's interesting because people thought that that was the option, and to some extent uh, it was and, and remains, but amongst the, the Burmese leadership, amongst the military cohort that led the country, a cohort that had cut their teeth fighting 
Burmese communists, supported by the Communist Party in China, and constant border clashes since with various groups uh, that essentially cross the border from China and so on. So in other words, a, a leadership cohort that had no liking for China at all, um, this fed into uh, not only just, just that dynamic, their own personal experience, etc., but also a deep-seated fear amongst the leadership in Burma that in the end, Burma would really uh, amount to nothing much more than a vassal state in China. So the idea that this was an option is certainly true, I think, in the short term, but the fear of China uh, is very much there in Burma. It's there now, but it was certainly there, I think, back in that period as well. J just to give some illustration of the dominance, uh, trade between Burma and China uh, was uh, con constituted about 34% of Burma's trade back as recently as 2010. Um, and uh, that was, in a sense, underplayed because there was a much more trade that was going across the border as well. But in terms of foreign investment, it was 95% of foreign investment in 2010 into Burma was coming from China. So the relationship was an extremely close one. But again, as I say, I don't think it was a particularly comfortable one. And so the idea that change needed to happen to give Burma other options rather than simply the Chinese one uh, was a really significant factor. But of course, those options had been closed off by sanctions, uh, necessitating a, chi a, a change in Burma's you know, fundamental political economy. So again, amongst all sorts of other considerations, which there certainly were many others as well. I think many people in the leadership thought that the country reached a dead end, etc. Uh, it was time for a change for other reasons. But I think the sanctions issue at that point uh, became uh, quite a significant one. Um, so that's why I think sanctions were important in, in, in Burma. Um, some other things I just wanted to touch upon as well, because it is still a, a live issue. I mentioned that the US maintains the SDN list. I think that's quite productive. One week ago, uh, one of the very significant business figures in Burma was removed from the SDN list. Uh, and I think this was a, a very positive development of sanctions, and it's a way of, in a sense, giving something back, if you like, or trying to, to uh, direct some things in Burma towards towards good ends. Uh, this particular person, by the name of U Winong, uh, heads up basically the Confederation of Industry in Burma, so the head of the representative group. Um, he's regarded as a reasonably liberal figure, but he was very much a connected figure to the old regime, so he was a problematic person 10 years ago, but now he's a person uh, very much uh, part of the reform story. So being able to reward people like that by coming off the US SDN list, I think is, is quite productive, um, both in Burma and, and to some extent outside it as well. Um, but likewise, within the last six months, there's actually been some additions to the list, and in particular, the addition of a character called uh, U Ong Tong, I think was deeply significant. Uh, U Ong Tong was long known as the so-called bag man uh, for the old dictator Tan Shui. Um, he, he used to be the, the minister of industry number one, as they used to call it in Burma, but he was very much in charge of the economy under Than Shui. Um, he's a figure who remains very significant in the country. His children uh, own a lot of uh, corporate entities in the place. Um, he's connected with an older group of, uh, I guess one would call um, anti-reform recalcitrants or uh, some other such label, um, who were quite resistant uh, to reform and doing all sorts of things that are deeply problematic in uh, right up to this present day. I, I think people in this audience will be familiar perhaps with some of the communal violence that's currently taking place in Burma. Uh, and a lot of that is funded by uh, Ong Tong and, and people connected with his uh, particular political faction of the ruling party. So the placement of someone like that, I think, on the sanctions list, so adding people, which sort of goes against the trend, uh, can actually be quite productive. Um, it can also be productive, I think, just in terms of uh, helping Burma through the transition. Uh, like a lot of countries at this stage of transition, uh, much of the commanding heights and much of the rest of the economy is captured by uh, an economic elite connected to the old regime. Many of these people are, are quite frankly, nothing much more than, than rent seekers. Uh, they're, they're not the source, uh, I, I would maintain, of Burma's uh, future prosperity. Um, and so the extent to which these people uh, can't access fully uh, international investment and become the ideal partners, which they otherwise could, because they've certainly got 
contacts to foreign investors, etc., is, is in a sense not a bad thing because uh, how sanctions are sort of uh, functioning in this context is just to keep some of the worst elements, I think, of the business community there at bay while allowing some space for some new players as well. So there's a little bit of positive aspect, I think, to the current sanctions regime, the way that it has been unwound, and what remains, I think, can still be productively used. Um, likewise, as I mentioned earlier, the fact that sanctions remain suspended rather than completely eliminated is no bad thing. Um, in November, Burma comes towards some very critical elections. Constitutional reform is required uh, for these elections to be free and fair in, in any reasonable assessment. Um, those changes have not taken place yet. There's all sorts of other pl uh, problems in the country. And I think the fact that, uh, that sanctions and various other measures like that uh, remain on the books is, is not a bad thing uh, for a regime that, that is otherwise really... Uh, been greeted with applause by the international community and, and to some extent uh, been greeted with a situation which the, the pressure, uh, if you like, is very much off. Um, now, uh, final point to note is that ha having said that some sanctions remain, I think this now places a lot of responsibility uh, on the US Treasury, for instance, which maintains the, the SDN list to make sure that that is up to date and relevant, that the right people are targeted, that the people who deserve to be off the list come off the list, etc. Um, but, but having said that, that, that is a responsibility, of course, uh, one cannot be but aware that Burma has very much gone down the, uh, the list of priorities, I would imagine. Action, uh, for the US Treasury and various other people these days. So um, it's a big call to that extent, but it's certainly one that, um, that needs to be made. Um, so I guess I'll end there um, by putting a case that I think in, uh, for Burma uh, in recent times, uh, sanctions played a, a positive role. We're now going to turn to North Korea. Uh, and our speaker, uh, we're going in descending order of technological uh, e um, sophistication. We started with Skype, and now we're going to go to PowerPoint, and we're going to close with nothing, <laughs> which is what I, I would be best at, but I haven't even been asked. Um, anyway, uh, Marcus uh, Nolan is uh, Executive Vice President and Director of Studies at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Uh, in Washington. He has been associated with that institute since 1985 and was deputy director of it between 2009 and 2012. His book, uh, his 2000 book, uh, Avoiding the Apocalypse, the Future of the Two Koreas, won the O'Hara Memorial Award in, uh, when it came out in 2000. And he's written a number of books uh, on the Koreas and on, uh, also on um, the economics and geopolitics of natural resource governance. And uh, his brief is the same as the rest of the panel, so we'll hear about the relative effectiveness of these uh, sanctions and then um, move on from there. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you. It's, uh, it's uh, an honor and a pleasure to be here this morning. I'm going to use the term sanctions broadly to encompass a variety of policies that are undertaken to inhibit cross-border exchange, which can include both goods and finance. And indeed, I'm going to make the argument that both the logic and the effects of uh, sanctions in the case of North Korea on goods and on money are, are really quite different. So um, I'm an American, we're in the United States, and this is a largely an American audience. So let me start by talking about US bilateral sanctions against North Korea, and then move on to multilateral sanctions and some um, other arguments. The United States has um, economic sanctions against North Korea going all the way back to 1950 and the Korean War. They have been since supplemented by an extensive web of other measures, uh, some of which one might term unilateral economic diplomacy, restrictions on uh, things like uh, restrictions that are not necessarily aimed at North Korea per se, but they're conditions of U.S. economic engagement with the rest of the world. So, for example, to be eligible to be a recipient of Exim Bank loans, one has to make uh, certain, uh, reach certain standards with respect to protection of intellectual property rights or workers' rights or human rights, including religious rights. Similar restrictions apply to the ability of the executive direct, American executive directors at multilateral 
multilateral development banks to vote in favor of membership or vote in favor of loans to such countries and so on. And I don't actually expect you to be able to read any of this. Indeed, I was hoping to get a laugh. Um, this is a sort of a visual gesture, a rhetorical gesture, just to try to demonstrate to you that this really is quite, um, quite an extensive web. Um, some of these provisions are legislated, and undoing them would require um, legislative action. Uh, some of them are um, uh, undertaken uh, by the executive and can be reversed by executive order. Um, some of you were here yesterday and observed this rather strange and contentious uh, exchange between Dan Dresner and Andrew Arato. Uh, one of the issues they got into arguing about was the nature of legitimacy, with Arato arguing that uh, measures taken multilaterally have higher uh, degrees of legitimacy. And indeed, uh, most of the recent American sanctions have been grounded in a series of three UN resolutions uh, undertaken in October 2006, June 2009, and March 2013 in response to successive North Korean nuclear tests. Uh, and I will uh, uh, come back to the, the nature of those sanctions in a moment. Additional sanctions legislation currently is before the U.S. Congress uh, and would probably pass easily in the event of a fourth nuclear test. Sanctions have also been undertaken bilaterally by other countries, most prominently Japan and South Korea, for particular interests of uh, uh, bilateral disputes, which I will not go into in the interest of time. So that's sort of the overview of bilateral sanctions. What about multilateral sanctions? Well, as I mentioned, multilateral sanctions have been undertaken in response to three UN Security Council resolutions associated with the three North Korean nuclear tests. Most of those sanctions are what I would call defensive sanctions. These are trade embargoes aimed at disrupting North Korean exports and imports of, uh, in the military sphere. And uh, there is uh, a number of documented interdictions on the export side where North Korea was attempting to export military hardware and it was interdicted by uh, other countries under these UN resolutions. There is less documented evidence in the public domain of success on interdicting inflows of uh, weapons or components for things like missiles or the nuclear program. Uh, it, I do not know if this is because we've had, actually had less success at interdicting these materials or if it's simply that uh, the nature of um, those, um, those interdictions is that they have not been reported publicly. There is a smaller component of the sanctions which I would argue are punitive in nature and they have been um, uh, uh, aimed at luxury goods consumed by the elite. So there are sanctions on luxury goods exports to North Korea, and I'll go into a bit more detail on that in a moment. The more recent UN resolutions have also included financial sanctions, and I would like to spend just a moment talking about the differing um, uh, dynamics of trade and financial sanctions. My understanding is that Dan Dresner talked a bit about this yesterday in his overview remarks, and it'll also echo something Sean just said in his discussion of Myanmar. Um, if a country imposes trade sanctions on another country, it immediately encounters um, a political economy problem at home because you're telling your local businessmen not to make money doing something they used to do. So there's an immediately a, an internal lobby against the sanction or in terms of weakening the sanction because you're preventing people from making money. Um, and in addition to this kind of very, uh, this intrinsic problem that the sending country faces, there's also a bureaucratic problem in which um, typically the sanction is negotiated by the foreign ministry, but it's actually implemented by another agency of the government, typically a customs administration or something like this. So not only do you have an issue of uh, there's a political economy to weaken the sanctions, you have the actual negotiator and the implementer typically in most countries not being the same part of the government. So trade sanctions are always a bit problematic. 
Financial sanctions uh, operate on a really different logic. And the prime example of a financial sanction, I think, overall, and certainly the prime example in the case of North Korea, is the 2007 uh, Banco Delta Asia case. Under Section 301 of the Patriot Act, the United States Treasury identified a small bank in Macau called Banco Delta Asia, or BDA, as a primary money laundering concern. In particular, they were alleged to be laundering money associated with North Korean uh, exports of missile components and imports of uh, components associated with the nuclear program. Um, the, 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 the logic, the North Korea's, um, uh, th there were two sorts of effects. The first effect was North Korea's links to the rest of the world through the financial sphere were very, very, very small, even compared to, say, Iran, as we discussed yesterday. So crippling ban ban Banco Delta Asia was actually a huge blow to the North Korean financial system. It resulted in an immediate colla uh, collapse of the black market value of the North Korean won. Uh, there was a diminution of trade. Uh, the, the sort of gifts that are normally handed out by the regime on you know, important ceremonial days like the anniversary of the founding of the party and things like that, uh, Santa Claus had a much smaller bag that year. Uh, so there were clear effects on the North Korean economy. One of the reasons for those effects was the logic of the sanction. What the sanction said was, if you do business with Banco Delta Asia and thereby with North Korea, you will be considered by the US Treasury a participant in money laundering and prohibited from the US market. And so banks all over the world, but in particular big Chinese banks, looked at the situation of they're making a small bit of money in North Korea and a large amount of money in the United States. And they did the commercially prudent thing, which is sever ties with North Korea. So the logic of the sanction is not we're compelling you to do something. And if you don't do it, which is preventing you from making money, Complying with the sanction in this case is a way to continue to make money. And it typically, to the extent it involves financial regulators like the central bank, these are people who have a different set of interests, a different set of values. They're not worried about diplomacy with North Korea. They're worried about things that central bankers worry about. And hence, they tend to, they tend to be relatively responsive in this case. And so, for example, the monetary authorities in Macau and the People's Bank in China both cooperated with the Treasury uh, in this action. It's not as clear that you would have gotten the same degree of cooperation, say, between the Chinese Foreign Ministry and the State Department. It just operates differently bureaucratically. And for this reason, um, financial sanctions, at least in the case of North Korea, have had uh, clearly had more effects. Now, have they had effects of achieving the political goals of ending the nuclear program or, or the missile program? Well, the conventional wisdom on, on sanctions is sanctions work when the target country is small and weak, the goal is to alter behavior, which is not a core political commitment of the sanctioned regime, and the sanctioning coalition itself is, um, is uh, uh, universal. So how does that stack up in the uh, North Korean case? Well, the target is small and weak, good. Um, however, the goal is actually uh, of ending the nuclear missile program uh, is a central regime political commitment. So uh, previous history tells us we're unlikely to be able to uh, alter uh, core political commitments using economic sanctions. And then in terms of the coalition, um, China's largest trade partner, China, has been uh, relatively in an unenthusiastic about uh, implementing sanctions. One of the things about the UN sanctions resolution was that it allowed each individual country to define what a luxury was. Uh, and some countries, and in this graph I'm showing, I use data from Australia and Japan, uh, they came out with lists of goods that were considered luxury and hence prohibited by Japanese or Australian firms to, um, to export to North Korea. China never produced such a list. And indeed, I know of a, a South Korean reporter posing as a Korean businessman who once went to the Chinese government and asked for the list to make sure he wouldn't get in trouble. And uh, they said they couldn't provide such a list. If you take the list of luxury items provided by Japan, or you take the list of luxury items provided by Australia, or you take the list of banned luxury items uh, provided by the European Union, and you apply that to China, uh, North Korea trade data, what you will see, as in uh, the, the uh, left-hand panel, is that those luxury goods 
uh, exports to North Korea have more or less risen monotonically uh, during the entire period that North Korea has been under sanction. And today, they're probably on the order of, say, $300 uh, million. So clearly, luxuries are getting into North Korea via China, though I want to underline the luxury goods themselves are, uh, are often not of Chinese origin. They may be European luxury goods or something like that. Um, well, okay, so the luxury good uh, embargo doesn't seem to be working very well. How about the more general argument that by uh, imposing economic sanctions, one raises the risk premium on trade, and hence it should have a, a kind of uh, a, uh, uh, a dampening effect of trade overall? Uh, well, I'm not sure if Andrew is here today or not, uh, but I'm going to, I'm presenting some, um, uh, some graphs that underlying them have some econometric models. And what those models suggest is that in the case of China, there is no evidence that uh, the imposition of UN sanctions had any effect uh, in terms of raising the risk premium broadly on bilateral trade with North Korea. The same does not hold for South Korea. The first um, set of sanctions had no effect. But the second set of sanctions, and then more importantly, unilateral sanctions undertaken uh, by South Korea in 2010 after the sinking of a South Korean naval vessel and the bombing of a South Korean island, uh, they had pronounced effects on uh, South Korean trade with uh, North uh, Korea. So in sum, uh, and I should have mentioned this at the beginning because I'm used to teaching MBA students and they want the answer, uh, and they want it at the very beginning, um, the answer the answer, I gave it to you. The answer is um, low likelihood of successfully using sanctions to terminate the nuclear missile programs. Sanctions might play some uh, role uh, in a broader strategy that used other diplomatic tools as well. But importantly, um, inducements uh, do not seem to have much of an effect either. And that has to do with the nature of the regime. Um, basically, the North Korean regime, the, tar the, the effectiveness of sanctions depends uh, in large part on the degree of accountability uh, of the target government and the nature of its political uh, constituencies. And the sad, uh, the sad aspect of the North Korean case is this is a government that is extraordinarily unaccountable and has an absolutely unparalleled um, uh, capacity for inflicting misery on its own people. And so to, uh, to uh, preempt Eric's question, I think the, bi the single biggest difference between North Korea and the other two cases we're discussing this morning is the North Korean case is simply so extreme. Um, if there's any one thing that you, you take away from this talk, um, it, I, hope it's, it, I hope it's these pictures, and I don't put them up as a joke. I'm actually quite serious. Uh, the slide on the um, left is a photo of Google chairman um, Eric Schmidt in his visit to North Korea. As you can see, he appears to be in an unheated room because uh, everybody's still bundled up in their uh, overcoats. Uh, and he's uh, standing there looking over the shoulder of a North Korean soldier who himself is in a quilted jacket um, in front of a computer terminal with photographs of Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il in the background. Um, when Mr. Uh, Schmidt, who is the chair of one of the world's most uh, dynamic and innovative technology companies, came to North Korea, and in a man, because of his political activities here in the United States, if he calls the White House, they actually pick up the phone. Uh, when he went to North Korea, uh, Kim Jong-un had no time to meet with him. In contrast, Kim Jong-un has had days on end to party with Dennis Rodman Circus Act. And um, this slide normally elicits a certain degree of laughter, and I hear tittering coming from that side of the room. Um, but I'm absolutely serious here. I think the choice of your friends says something about you. And unfortunately, I think uh, this allocation of time by Kim Jong-un uh, probably says a lot about his priorities and his capacity for leadership. And in, uh, when sanctioning a regime that has that kind of political system and that kind of leadership, one has to be very modest about what one thinks that one can accomplish through economic sanctions. And sadly, one has to be symmetrically and equally modest about what one can accomplish through economic inducements. If I had another 20 minutes, I could give you the whole story on how inducements haven't worked either. Um, ultimately, the future of North Korea depends largely 
on the preferences and capacities of its leadership and the outside world uh, should not exaggerate how much influence we have on these outcomes. Thank you. I look forward to the rest of our discussion. So Marcus and I just met this morning, and, and Sean, and I know Sean exactly as well as all of you do. Um, but I've actually known Bill Leogran not only since before we both had white hair, but since before I was even concerned about having white hair. Um, back in, in uh, uh, really 30 years ago, uh, I, I introduced Bill to give talks on Central America. Um, when I had a job working for the World Policy Institute, which was then a part of the New School, and um, I used to bring in speakers to brief congressional staff and certain congressional members on issues of import, and back then the import issue of import was American attempts to overthrow the government of Nicaragua and um, prop up the uh, dictatorship in El Salvador. Um, since then, uh, uh, I've read and uh, found enormously useful uh, Bill's book, uh, include, um, Our Own Backyard, which is a history of the United States and Central America. Uh, I actually used it for my dissertation uh, very helpfully. And, uh, and I recently read his uh, most recent book that he co-authored with um, Peter Kornblue called Back Channel to Cuba, The Hidden History of Negotiations Between Washington and Havana. So. Uh, I, I take the uh, conference panelists' word that, that we've had the right people on the right topics, uh, but I'm not really competent to judge that. I am competent to say we're very lucky to have Bill Leogrun here to tell us about the uh, effect and uh, consequences of the U.S. embargo on Cuba. Bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is this working? No? Yeah? Thank you very much. Um, so the first thing to understand about economic sanctions uh, against Cuba, or the embargo for short, or as the Cubans call it, el bloqueo, the blockade, um, is that it's not a single set of sanctions, but rather it's comprised, as in the North Korean case, of a complex set of laws, uh, presidential determinations, and executive orders. Um, it began as a partial trade embargo uh, under President Eisenhower in 1960 when he cut off the Cuban sugar quota. Um, and that was important because uh, about 50% of Cuba's gross domestic product was based on the sugar industry, and about 80% of that sugar was exported to the United States. So by cutting off the Cuban sugar quota, Eisenhower was really declaring economic war on the revolutionary government. Um, and then shortly thereafter, uh, Cuba responded, of course, by nationalizing almost all U.S. property on the island. And then the Eisenhower administration responded back by uh, banning any uh, exports from the United States to Cuba with the one exception of food and medicine. <clears throat> but then in 1962, President Kennedy extended the sanctions to a total embargo. Um, he invoked his executive authority under the Foreign Assistance Act of 1961, which had a provision in it precisely aimed at Cuba, and also under the 1917 Trading with the Enemies Act, which enabled him uh, to declare a national state of emergency. He actually relied on one Harry Truman had de uh, declared at the beginning of the Korean War rather than introduce a new one. Um, and that prohibited all transactions of any sort with Cuba, although the president had the authority to license exceptions to that. And that's a really important point that, that will become critical to understanding how it is that over the years, the sanctions regime against Cuba has become tougher and looser over time under different presidential administrations, depending upon whether the president preferred a strategy of using hard power or soft. Um, by the time Lyndon Johnson came into office, it was pretty clear that the Cuban government wasn't going to be overthrown by uh, U.S. sanctions combined with the uh, secret war by the CIA. And so the Johnson policy was really one of, of what was called economic denial. And the strategy there was to try to multilateralize the U.S. embargo by enlisting Latin America and, and Europe to join it. Um, Europeans uh, did on an informal basis and imperfectly. Uh, but in 1964, Latin America, through the Organization of American States, actually adopted mandatory uh, economic sanctions. And every country in Latin America except Mexico uh, then 
cut off all diplomatic and economic connections to Cuba. Uh, the embargo began to erode in the 1970s uh, as the Europeans and Latin Americans decided that it really didn't make a lot of sense anymore. And one by one, they began to break from uh, a willingness to abide by it. Um, and it was a result of that uh, loss of, of international support that Henry Kissinger began to think seriously about the possibility of normalizing relations uh, with Cuba. And in 1975, the United States actually did vote uh, with uh, a majority of the OAS to lift the 1964 sanctions. And after that, Latin American countries, one by one, gradually over time, restored normal economic and diplomatic relations with the island. Um, but Kissinger's in, uh, efforts to engage in a bilateral negotiation with Cuba to try to normalize relations came to an end when the Cubans uh, intervened in Angola. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, that effort came to an end. The one other thing that happened under the Ford administration, worth mentioning, is that uh, the lifting of a prohibition, or lifting of the embargo on sales to Cuba by foreign subsidiaries of U.S. corporations. So General Motors of Argentina, which was a case in point, uh, became uh, able to sell cars and trucks to Cuba. Uh, and the reason for this was that the extraterritorial quality of that aspect of the embargo was causing diplomatic problems for the United States and Latin America. President Carter came into office, and he came with a real intention to try to normalize the relationship with Cuba. He lifted the ban on travel to Cuba uh, completely in uh, his first few weeks in office. Uh, he considered lifting a ban on sales of food and medicine, but at that point, uh, Cuba was still a, uh, the Cuban economy was still built around the production of sugar. Sugar is food, and so to lift the embargo on food and medicine would have been for the most part, to lift the embargo in, uh, not in its entirety, but in, in substance. And Carter wasn't willing to do that without a negotiation wherein the United States would get some quid pro quo. Um, and although there was uh, good progress in the bilateral discussions in 1977, by 1978, Cuban involvement in Africa had again sort of brought that progress uh, to a halt, and it stalled after that. When President Reagan, of course, came into office with a very, very tough line on Cuba, he thought Cuba was responsible for the wars in Central America. Um, and so he, he tightened uh, the sanctions regime back up again. He reimposed the ban on travel to Cuba that President Carter had lifted. Uh, he put Cuba on the list, uh, State Department list of state sponsors of terrorism, which has its own set of, of economic sanctions, particularly on the financial front. Um, and he tightened the enforcement of the, uh, uh, the trade embargo, particularly for companies that were doing business through Panama. A number of U.S. companies were actually selling goods to Cuba uh, by using cutouts in Panama. So they would sell goods to the front corporation in Panama. Panama would then sell them to Cuba. These, these companies in Panama were actually owned by the Cuban government. Uh, and so the Reagan administration began to... to uh, crack down on that by fining the U.S. companies that were engaged in these kinds in these kinds of activities, and putting the Panamanian companies on these list of designated uh, uh, nationals or designated um, entities that that were subject to the embargo. Um, President George H.W. Bush signed the Cuban Democracy Act, which reimposed the ban on subsidiaries of U.S. corporations abroad doing business with Cuba. So he tightened up the, uh, the embargo as well. President Clinton moved things back in the other direction again. Uh, he loosened the restrictions on travel uh, to Cuba, although not repealing them entirely, as President Carter had done, um, but, but allowing uh, uh, 12 categories of legal travel whereby people could go, sometimes without having to get permission from the Treasury Department, sometimes having to get permission from the Treasury Department before they did it. But he introduced what was called the people-to-people -people educational travel category, which became very quickly the principal category for travel to Cuba by non-Cuban Americans. Cuban Americans were able to go for uh, family reasons, uh, with some restrictions, but uh, they had a much easier time going than, uh, than non-Cuban Americans. But this people-to-people -people category opened up 
uh, travel by non-Cuban Americans, as long as you went with a, a travel provider who would put on an educational program, and that provider would have to get permission from the Treasury Department. Um, the other thing that Clinton did, probably the single most important thing that, that Clinton did with regard to Cuba sanctions, was he signed the Helms-Burton legislation, the uh, Cuban uh, Democracy and uh, Liberty and, and Democratic Solidarity Act of 1996, which wrote the embargo into law. And the actual provision is that the uh, Cuban sanctions as written into the Cuban assets uh, control regulations as of the passage of Helms-Burton are written into law. And Jesse Helms, one of the sponsors, thought that that would essentially freeze the sanctions regime in place and make it impossible for a president to improve relations with Cuba. And in fact, um, he called it, uh, he, sa he said the intention of the legislation was to be Clinton proof because he thought that President Clinton was of a mind to try to improve relations with Cuba. What uh, Senator Helms and his staff hadn't thought through entirely was the fact that the Cuban asset control regulations also include the president's licensing authority. So not only did they write into law the sanctions, but they also wrote into law the president's executive authority to make exceptions to the embargo. And that's what presidents have used ever since to either loosen or tighten sanctions depending upon their policy preferences. Um, and finally, the one last thing that Clinton did before he left office was to sign the 2000 Trade Sanctions uh, and Export Reform Act which did two things with regard to Cuba. It legalized, finally, the sale of food, and well, agricultural products more broadly, it doesn't have to be just food, uh, to Cuba. And that produced over the next decade um, trade that ranged from about 300 million to about $700 million in uh, the sale, US sale of agricultural exports uh, to Cuba. Um, but the other thing that law did was to explicitly prohibit tourist travel to Cuba. So now the travel ban was written into, or at least the ban on tourist travel specifically, was written into law. Um, George W. Bush came in again with a much tougher attitude towards Cuba and he eliminated the whole people to people educational travel category completely. He tightened down academic travel to make it almost impossible for there to be academic exchanges with Cuba. He even tightened the restrictions on Cuban American travel and remittances which was not popular actually in, in uh, South Florida broadly but was very popular in that hard line element of the Miami community that was a, a Republican base. And then of course then President Obama came in and, and moved things back in the other direction. The first thing he did in 2009 was to get rid of all the restrictions on Cuban American travel or remittances. And this had an enormous impact. Uh, remittances from Cuban Americans to family on the island went from about a billion dollars in 2008 to uh, over $3 billion today, plus another $3 billion in gift packages, which is to say things that you carry down for your family. Uh, gift packages used to be restricted to uh, medicine, food, really consumer essentials, if you will. Uh, now anything can be sent, and I, I was in the Miami airport not long ago and saw a pallet of widescreen TVs taller than me being sent down as gift packages. What they were actually were, were inputs to small business. Uh, people were opening home theaters in their living rooms where they'd have their relatives in Miami buy them a widescreen TV, and then they would charge their neighbors a peso or two to come in and watch pirated US movies on their widescreen TV. Um, Cuban American travel went from about 100,000 people a year to uh, last year 400,000 Cuban Americans traveled to Cuba. So uh, the Obama changes in 2009 uh, in some ways primed the Cuban American community for a broader opening to Cuba which the president just announced uh, in December. Um, in 2008 I should mention uh, the president also restored people to people uh, exchanges, or people-to-people -people travel, and academic travel back to at least to what they had been 
uh, previously. And then finally, of course, we know in December the president announced that uh, it was his intention to normalize relations with Cuba, and he made a number of important exceptions to the embargo, allowing sale of telecommunications equipment and services, um, allowing trade, two-way trade with Cuban small businesses, um, granting general travel licenses to all 12 categories of legal travel, which means nobody has to ask the Treasury Department anymore for permission. You are presumed to be able to go, although you can be audited by Treasury, so you have to keep good records. Um, and, he, and, and the President has called on Congress now to um, repeal the embargo. Uh, Congress is probably not likely to do that, this Congress in particular, since it has a narrative that the president is weak on foreign policy and, and weak on our, uh, uh, our appeases, appeases our adversaries, and, and both the leadership in both the House and Senate have come out against the president's policy on Cuba, so it's not too likely that we're going to see the embargo get repealed. But um, there are three key laws now that govern the embargo and prevent uh, a president from getting rid of it entirely. One, obviously, is Helms-Burton itself, which has written the embargo into law. Uh, the other is the Cuban Democracy Act of 1992, which prohibits third country subsidiary trade. And the third is the Trade Sanctions Reform and Export Enhancement Act, which prohibits tourist travel. So over the years, what's been the impact of these sanctions on Cuba? Well, when they were first imposed in 1960 and 1961, the impact on Cuba was, was severe. Um, basically, all of Cuba, Cuba's capital stock was from the United States. And all of a sudden, they couldn't get spare parts for any of it. Virtually 80% uh, of Cuban trade was with the United States. And all of a sudden, that trade falls to zero. Um, but the Soviet Union stepped in and picked up the, the slack, if you will. And if uh, I, when I if I'd done a PowerPoint, I have a slide actually that I use in class that shows the crossing curves of U.S. trade and Soviet trade with Cuba. And the U.S. trade starts out here and the Soviet trade starts out here. And in 1961, they go just like that. So the Soviet Union stepped in and cushioned for the Cubans the economic impact of, of the embargo. And so by the 1970s, the embargo was an annoyance and costly annoyance to Cuba, but it was not an existential threat by any means. Then the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, at the same time that the Cuban Democracy Act prohibited subsidiary trade, which was about $700 million a year, U.S. subsidiaries abroad, and it was mostly f trade in food and medicine. So that hit Cuba at an extraordinarily vulnerable time. Uh, the impact on the Cuban economy, the collapse of the Soviet Union, was a fall of gross domestic product of 35% in the space of two years, just an enormous economic shock. And that revived hopes in Washington that the Cuban government might actually be overthrown. Right? Uh, in Miami, people said, you know, next Christmas in Havana. That was the idea, that the regime was on its last legs. Well, in fact, the regime did not collapse. It gradually, very gradually recovered during the course of the 1990s. So that by the turn of the century, it was pretty, pretty clear, once again, that um, the embargo had become costly, and maybe even a little more than an annoyance, but no longer an existential threat. Um, but lifting the embargo does hold some enormous potential opportunities for Cuba. Cuba is undergoing an important uh, process right now of economic reorganization and reform. Um, it is uh, becoming more of a market socialist economy on the model of Vietnam and China. It's looking abroad for direct foreign investment. And the United States obviously is the, uh, the source, uh, potential source of enormous investment in Cuba. Uh, U.S. businesses are, just, are eager to get in there if, if they can, if they could. Um, and secondly, the Cuban economy now has been reoriented away from sugar toward tourism. And the United States is the principal source of tourists going to the Caribbean. Uh, there's an uh, IMF study that was done not long ago that projects that if the tourist ban were lifted, as many as 3 million U.S. tourists might travel to Cuba a year. That would actually double the number of foreign visitors going to Cuba annually. 
So enormous potential for trade, enormous potential for investment, enormous potential for tourism. And as Cuba is reorganizing its economy, I think that it has obviously a, a, an important incentive to want to see uh, the embargo finally lifted. But what it's not willing to do, uh, as, as uh, Marcus was discussing in the conclusions to his, uh, his remarks, it's not willing to change its basic uh, social, economic, or political structure as the price of getting the embargo lifted. It never has been willing to. Uh, in 1961, uh, John F. Kennedy's special assistant Richard Goodwin met with Che Guevara in Buenos Aires at the founding conference of the Alliance for Progress. And, and Che offered uh, rapprochement with the United States. Um, uh, if the United States would stop trying to overthrow the Cuban government, Cuba would stop trying to export revolution to Latin America. But Che was very clear that uh, they would not put on the negotiating table the nature of their system, that is to say, the socialist character of the revolution. Um, so if we look back as, uh, in assessing uh, the efficacy of, of U.S. economic sanctions against Cuba. In, 1960, in the 1960s, the goal was regime change and obviously failed. Uh, it was that again in the early 1990s and obviously failed. In the 70s and 80s, it was more uh, seen by U.S. policymakers as a source of leverage to make Cuba a negative example for other countries, to drain resources from the Soviet Union, and eventually to try to use as a bargaining chip in negotiations uh, with the Cubans to get them to stop exporting revolution and to at one point kick out the Soviets if we could get them to do that. And it wasn't very successful in achieving any of those goals either. By the beginning of the 21st century, it had actually become an albatross to U.S. foreign policy because uh, no one in the world supported it. Uh, the United Nations has held votes for the last two decades annually um, in the General Assembly, a uh, resolution sponsored by Cuba condemning the U.S. embargo and demanding it, that it be listed, lifted. Uh, the United States has lost every single one of those votes. Uh, last year, the vote was 184 to 2, the two being the United States and Israel. And Israel has good commercial relations with Cuba, so they're voting with the United States for different reasons. Uh, we lost Palau, the, which had voted with us the year before. Um, and at the sixth summit of the Americas in Cartagena, Colombia in 2012, the summit was really taken over by and disrupted by this issue of Cuba. And the Latin Americans said that w they wouldn't come to another summit if Cuba wasn't invited to the next one. So the diplomatic cost to the United States of pursuing this policy uh, had really gone up pretty dramatically. Uh, and I think the president finally realized that, as he said in the State of the Union, this was a, a policy beyond its, its expiration date. On the positive side, the fact that uh, he has even said his, he intends to normalize relations with Cuba, even while the embargo is still in place, has actually led to both Latin American allies and European allies uh, to talk with the United States about having a more coordinated policy towards Cuba to try to pressure the Cubans uh, to improve their human rights practices. Uh, the embargo was really an impediment to that kind of cooperation because no one else in the world supported it. And now that, that we're moving away from it, there is actually probably more likelihood of a uh, successful pursuit of at least some of the issues that are still on the bilateral agenda. Thanks.